Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome back to Poe on the Call. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Chris Rivers. And my name is Mandy Mack. Yes, and we are here with our... <laughs> I thought you froze for a moment, but we are here oh, okay. with episode. The episode is called, and it's a controversial one, so I can't wait to see what happens. Get being in the pole community again Dang. the pole community yes turn it up you <laughs> <laughs> right we thought that we would talk about this because whether it is actual gatekeeping or perceived gatekeeping um it is a thing um there's people out there who are going to block you from doing things because they want to keep their position in whatever they're in or um, you might be doing that to someone else unknowingly or maybe knowingly. Um, so we wanted to bring it up. Yes, with a disclaimer, these are just, um, I guess, kind of pretty much our opinions and what we have learned with all the stories we have been blessed to listen to. Um, of course, do your own research. You have your own feelings. Like Mandy said, gatekeeping is an actual thing and it's either really happening or it's a perceptual it's based on perception sometimes we think it's happening and it's not intentional by the person who is su supposedly gatekeeping so with that disclaimer being said yeah <laughs> <laughs> so let's um i looked up what gatekeeping means from the webster dictionary and gatekeeping is the activity of controlling and usually limiting general access to something. Um, so that's when, you know, you're doing something and someone comes along and they maybe try to like knock you down a peg for whatever reason. Um, and there's, you know, I guess just taking a look at the intentions behind it because I feel like there's, you know, gatekeeping most definitely is not a good thing except if it's being done for safety reasons. Um, so I wanted to bring up that before we go into anything else. Um, and an example of a safety um, example <laughs> of someone gatekeeping would be like, for example, I got a Lyra when I was doing aerial arts and I rigged from a tree and did all my aerial arts from this tree branch and posted it all on social media and then people reached out to me and they were like, Mandy, you should not be rigging from a tree. Um, that's so unsafe. And I was like, what, what do you know? Like this tree has been my, in my backyard for like forever. And I know my body and I'm safe, whatever. Um, but I was putting a bad example into the world showing that, you know, here I am safe on my tree doing aerials. Um, you can do it too. So then, you know, I understand now that that was a bad thing. And then come to find out that that tree was actually dead and it fell um, not even two years later in my yard. So that was a dangerous thing for me to do. And I was very thankful for those who kept my outdoor Lyra experience. And that led me to think more about safety. <laughs> As we all would, of course. <laughs> right, because if you get the aerial equipment, you're like, oh, of course I can rig it outside from this tree. But some trees are dead and they, you know, they might be hollow inside and it might be holding you for like a little bit, but then all of a sudden it's not. Another form of safety gatekeeping I find that most students are okay with, but there have been some students where like, uh, no, is like if you're trying an upside down trick for the first time, you should have a mat underneath. Your instructor isn't trying to say you suck or anything. They're trying to do it for safety. Put a mat underneath you, except, especially if it's your first time trying that trick. We don't care if you've been upside down a hundred times. Um, it's safety gatekeeping. That's another way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, or if you see, um, there was another instance in my past where um, it was a dance educator um, who had no aerial training or background at all and was hired at this new aerial studio that just opened up um, to teach aerial dance. And so um, it took me a while to, to come to this friend about it, but I, I felt really strongly about it that 
they shouldn't be teaching aerial dance without even having taken an aerial dance class before on equipment um, that they didn't know anything about. And come to find out that the studio didn't know anything about aerials either. Um, it was told to me that their aerial hammocks were always falling down and that was normal. Um, and the studio didn't last more than like six months. So I felt good about reaching out to this person regarding safety because Sometimes we're like given an opportunity where we feel like, wow, that's so awesome. I'm going to spread my love and joy of dance um, and not really thinking about that. There's like things you don't know that you don't know <laughs> and you're putting other people's lives in danger. Um, I was also in that situation. I was offered to teach Lyra um, after taking it for a few years. I was not an aerial instructor, but there was no Lyra classes in this community so I thought I was doing a good thing um, by teaching Lyra and then after a few classes I learned that there was so many things that I did not know and I felt inappropriate teaching Lyra after that and I stopped doing it um, but yeah no one told me to not do it <laughs> and I wish that someone had because it, you know teaching something that you're not familiar with is not a good idea um that was safety i think i guess another form of safety gatekeeping and again this is all on perception is say you're in a move doing a trick and your instructor is spotting you and they tell you no don't go on and you're like yeah 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 i could do it i could do it i could do it um and then you get mad when they keep telling you no and they try to guide you back down um some students unfortunately do that it has happened um understand that when an instructor says no don't continue um they're not trying to gatekeep you it could be a safety thing for them maybe they lost grip on you and they're afraid that they're going to drop you um maybe they can feel that you're not supporting your weight the right way and they want to get you down to explain it um so like i said it's all about perception <laughs> they're not stopping you because they don't want you to do it or they don't think you can it could be anything maybe they lost the grip and they're trying to keep you safe or they're not ready to for you to move on anything right that's so true it's all about like the communication of, about it as well and you know that it could be an instance where maybe the teacher was gatekeeping if they continuously do it over and over again, they're not letting you do the next trick. Then you gotta like be like, okay, is this safety or is this teacher just trying to inhibit me from doing something? But yeah, the perception of it and just being mindful and communicating about it. Um, yeah, right. That's where it gets a little bit like, what's going on here? And it's hard to tell what, um, how you should feel. <laughs> um let me see other forms of safety gatekeeping i think the most important one is uh, and this of course is perception and <laughs> everything's perception unfortunately <laughs> goodness i lost my train of thought <laughs> Sometimes us as instructors and coaches, we know what you cannot do. Um, and so when we say, don't do that handspring, we know your, your shoulders aren't ready for it. Uh, please don't do it. <laughs> We're not trying to gatekeep you. We just know a handspring, it's hard on your shoulders and your shoulders might not be supporting yourself in a simple chair spin like you should or something. Um, sometimes we see that your knee isn't as strong or as engaged as it should be, your knee hooks. So we'll say, eh, don't do this or do it this way and modify it. We're not trying to stop you from trying to progress, but for safety reasons, you should modify it so you don't lose the knee hook or things like that. Um, God, it's so fucking hard because it's all about perception. Right, um, right. And you can either listen to our good safety advice, keeping you from doing the bad thing to yourself, or you can just completely disregard, go to a space where it will be allowed <laughs> and do your own thing. 
But the big one is inverts. You shouldn't be jumping into inverts. It's not safe to put that much weight on your body if you're not ready for it. Yes, you got your leg up and stuff because you jumped, but there's a reason why we want you to control that for safety so you don't put all that weight on your body. We're not trying to gatekeep you. We're trying mm -hmm. to get you to use your muscles correctly, engage the right muscles, and be safe with it in a controlled movement. Same right. Way. I'm that. Yeah, I'm glad you said in the in the controlled way too, because like you said, people just flail their limbs up. And while you may be able to do that, like you might be hurting yourself, you might be also, you know, hurting the equipment that you're using because it's not meant to be flailed upon. <laughs> like you can I, take controlled motions. Yeah, like yeah. I've had students who are visiting our studio and I don't know what they learn at their studio, but when I tell them don't jump into your inverse, they get really upset. Uh, and really like, oh, well, my instructor says I could do this and that. That's okay with your other instructor. But with my certifications I took, you are not jumping into it for safety reasons. You should be engaging your muscles correctly, and you're going to learn how to do it correctly. So there are some students who will fight back <laughs> with you. Right. Um, and it's perception. They think you're trying to stop them. And yeah, I'm trying to stop you, but it's for your protection. Yeah. And I think that gatekeeping people for safety is always going to, you know, rub some people the wrong way, but you just have to stick to that. You have to stick to it because um, that, that's something you believe in. And that's, you know, part of how you, you teach. Um, you don't want to make exceptions for people who are annoyed. <laughs> um, okay. That was a lot of safety. I'm sure we'll have more safety as <laughs> We'll change gears away from safety. Um, what was one you wanted to talk about? Uh, pole level um, gatekeeping, right? Would yes. You... Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's important to have structure for each level, um, but I don't think it is useful for for studios to block students from going to the next level if they can't have certain if they don't have certain moves down because. Yeah. In my experience, what I've heard is sometimes students will be stuck in a level for years just because they can't do a certain trick um, or maybe they're required to do it on the right and the left, which not everyone can do. <laughs> so um, I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just something to think about whether your, you know, your level system in your studio is, um, is gatekeeping students some proceeding and just looking at whether the things that are blocking them are for safety reasons or if they're just because you think that students should you know have this certain move before they move on yes we all have to remember all our bodies are different some of us have injuries on certain sides some of us have this going on um and Oftentimes, no matter how many times we practice that bad side for whatever specific trick, we just can't get it because of shoulder damage, knee damage, or just the way your left side is proportioned to your right. Um, it really does suck. Um, to We get so many students that tell us, oh, they won't let me take level three because I can't get my invert on my left side or um, I can't go to level three because I can't invert at all, which I find to be bullshit because you can get upside down from a jasmine if taught correctly and which will open your vocabulary by a lot. Um, so it's hard. It is hard. I agree with you when you say, yes, create a set curriculum, have some structure. Also, in our certifications, it all teaches us be mindful of our different body types. Know that some people are not going to be able to do this, this way or that way. And we shouldn't stop them from moving on just because of that. Like, I would yeah. never get, uh, that's not true. I actually did a left-sided handspring for like five seconds the other day and I almost cried. But it has taken me a long time as opposed to my right. And that's just because of severe shoulder damage I have back from my stripping days. Um, and if we were in another studio, I probably wouldn't be able to move on because I can't get that left side. 
Mm -hmm. Right. I think about that all the time because I I also am, you know, not able to get any sort of handspring going on. So who's to say I would be stuck in, in someone's level for a really long time, even though I can do so many other things. <laughs> yeah. I've even heard like studios won't let their students move on if they can't um, straight leg invert. Like mm -hmm. if they can only back leg invert, um, then they're not ready. And I'm like, what the fuck? Right. <laughs> like inverted for years. I'm just now straight leg invert. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just thinking about like what these things do to, you know, some, some students will, will become completely completely crushed with these limitations and think that they're not good enough, which is completely not true. And that's probably not what you're trying to get across by creating these limitations. I'm sure that everyone's creating limitations to have goals, you know, for each level, but um, yeah, not every goal is for everyone. It's all about perception. <laughs> yes. Um. <laughs> We got to remember everybody's going to be a different level. No matter what level class you're teaching or taking, they're going to have high level ones, low level ones, high level twos. And it's our job as instructors to come up with variations to suit their body needs and their capabilities to have progressions and regressions, um, conditioning exercises to help them get there rather than say, oh, no, you're never going to be able to do that, or I don't want you doing that, give them some conditioning exercises so they see, okay, they're actively trying to get me in there. Um, yes. Yeah. Maybe right, providing the way and an alternative. <laughs> Sorry, what'd you say? This episode, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> right, there's so many things that will come off of this episode. Um, I mean, so, because we've had a lot of stories, and some of the stories we've heard with their experience of gatekeeping, like it is a real thing, and it is frustrating. Mm -hmm. Those are just the stories we've heard. So I can't imagine the ones in which we haven't heard. Yeah, yeah, right. This, yeah. But again, y'all, this is about perception. <laughs> if you mention something, and you're like, "Oh my god, I'm gatekeeping," we're not. We're not saying you're awful. It. Like we said, it's about perception. You probably didn't even know what you were doing is gatekeeping. But from a student's eyes or another instructor's eyes or another studio's eyes, this is what it looks like. Yeah. That's why we're talking about it. <laughs> yeah. I know for myself, I've, I've been on both sides. Um, definitely been gatekeeped a lot in my dance career. And it led me to also gatekeep others. Um, and I, you know, I remember there was a few times when like, there was like territories where we would like gang up on this other, you know, group of dancers that was like infringing on our performance space. And we would just gently remind them that they were in our territory. And I remember how terrible I felt inside doing these things, but we were all like together doing it. Um, but how is that building a community that's chasing people away? Um, and it's really toxic. I, I would feel really terrible for the people that I, you know, gatekeeped in that aspect. Um, and if I could take it back, I definitely would. Um, and I was just doing the thing that everyone else was doing in, in my industry. And I thought that's what we had to do to preserve our, like, the money that we're making in a certain area, which is stupid. <laughs> yeah. Goodness, that's level gatekeeping. What else on level gatekeeping? Oh, mm. uh, heels. Sometimes we hear that if you can't do heel, if you can't walk in heels, or if you don't know how to use heels, you can't take a heels class or whatever. I think that's pretty dumb. Um, I mean, how are you gonna learn by taking a class? <laughs> Um, and if you're worried about safety, well, then there's modifications coming with socks, coming with little kitty cat heels, and then work your way up. Um, yeah, I really, oh, if you can't walk the heels, you can't take this class. I've heard that like once or twice. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> uh, right. And then like, and then don't, that's the thing though, about the gatekeeping is saying you can't come to this but then not providing another way for them to reach that goal it's just like no 
Like you have to do this on your own and figure it out and then come back. (laughs) Um, I think another thing that might have, that might kind of touch it hand in hand with level gatekeeping is, um, I guess, how do I say? I don't even fucking know. Body gatekeeping and age gatekeeping with those levels. S- s- trying to stop someone because they're heavier set or they're older or um, certain body parts don't move like they should. Um, mm-hmm. Not letting them be able to try this trick or this combo just because of feelings you have based on what they look like. Um mm-hmm. Unfortunately, as an instructor, when I was a newbie instructor, even in yoga, I would do that unintentionally. Um, I'd be like, oh, this person probably can't do this, 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 that. And it was a very quick and humbling experience to find out that is not the fucking truth at all. Um, Yeah, we all make mistakes for sure. (laughs) Right? Yeah. And it's like, like you said, it's just because that's how, you know, it, the community is when you you know went through it and you were just perpetuating what how the ways that we were taught and we thought that this was how it was supposed to be and then instead of being curious when we're teaching we have expectations of our students (laughs) it was just so terrible um but yeah I'm I'm so thankful for those humbling experiences because I've also had them you know I'm glad I learned a lot of them fast (laughs) right yeah because you could do so much damage and people hold on to that the way that you made them feel they will hold on to that forever Thanks. Um, i mean it's a learning process um, a lot of times we take our opinions unintentionally and either teach a class or make a decision like it's fast we're in a class and it's go 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 and sometimes you know <laughs> subconsciously thinking <laughs> yeah right yeah definitely don't want the gatekeeping to accidentally slip out and if it does you know just like I don't know I always review my day after and like think about all the things that I've (laughs) word vomited and and try to you know make them right but next time I see the person if I've done some sort of blocking um yeah it's definitely a learning experience every day and just trying to stay curious about your students is something that's been very helpful for me rather than, you know, because I'll, I'll just say, I I grew up in the dance world. There's the perfect dancer body that unfortunately has been, you know, commercialized. <laughs> I don't know what it is. We're, we all think it's this one mold. I was blocked from, you know, certain trainings because I didn't have the perfect dancer body why would we waste our training on this person who's not going to succeed in this industry? Um, and then I perpetuated that too. <laughs> it's, it sucks. Um, but now, I, you know, I, I know 100% that is not true. Everybody has a dancer's body. Um, everyone's capable of so many amazing things. Um, you just have to give people a chance. And if they're trying to do those things and you find yourself... Um, you know, having negative feelings towards something that someone else is doing and you want to stand in their way, just think about why you're doing that. Um. (laughs) Another, I know this is a lot for levels. Another thing with levels, I think, um, and I haven't really experienced it, but I've heard other people's experience it, not teaching a student something just because you can't do it or um I don't know it's hard because you could be do you could be teaching you could do that just because you don't know how to spot them or you don't know how to do it or demonstrate but um to hold them back just because oh if I can't do that you can't do that or you shouldn't do that that's a completely different story I've never experienced that but I have heard a few occasions where that has happened oh I'm not going to teach you that because if I can't do that you can't do that or you shouldn't be doing that etc um I think I maybe in my in the beginning did that once and I learned that you know what no fuck it if I can't do it 
I can't do it or demonstrate, but we'll find a way to get you into it and spot you. Like there's so many videos to help us out. Um, yeah. I don't think I've ever been like, oh, fuck, this person's getting better than me. Uh, right, we should want our students to get better than us. Right, I'm always very clear too about my limitations. Be like, if you want to learn handsprings, do not come to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah go to chris <laughs> but if you want to do you know a gorgeous jade split or any other split in the world <laughs> you come to me because i will guide you yeah um and i think that's us as instructors or coaches we should always be learning every day um just because we can't get into something doesn't mean we can't learn how to teach it or spot for it to help our students get into it um yeah. Stop them just because you don't want them to pass you. I would like to say I don't know anybody like that. I hope I don't know anybody like that. And I hope nobody does that, but I don't know. I've only heard stories. Right. I've also heard stories of, yeah, teachers not teaching above a certain level just because they didn't want their students to be better than them, which is really sad. Yes. Like, why? Are you, I guess if it comes to like, what like the ownership of things and not wanting people to take them away from you, but no one can ever take your talent away from you ever. But that's then yours. But then there are <laughs> some things that you just know they can't do. Like I think that's maybe I have done it once or twice, where I'm like I can do it, so I know you can't, and I'm not trying to be mean, but I practiced very hard, and I know your level, and I know you can't. Like, I think that actually, <laughs> a month ago, someone was like, um, can we try this? I was like, we could try. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'll just try right now. And I completely fucked it up. And I was like, see how hard it is? I can't do it. I don't know. And I don't think you can do it. And she was like, um, I don't think I can, but I'll try. And sure enough, they tried and couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's things like that, like, where you know, yeah, it's not happening. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. I'll, I'll usually say like, oh, let's go to a progression leading up to it um, and try that first and see how that goes. And if it's, you know, and then there'll be a certain level where I'll be like, I do not know any more progressions. That's it. Try another teacher <laughs> and then suggest another teacher who could take them along the way. Yes, there have been students who have been in my class and I'm like, oh, damn, I wish I could do that. Or damn, I wish it was as pretty as that. But I've never, I don't think I've acted. Uh, and if I have, I apologize, but I don't think I've actively stopped someone from trying something just because I don't want them to surpass me. Goodness, I'm pretty sure I've never done that. I hope I've never. <laughs> <laughs> right, though, like, so I'll, I'll talk about my, the pole goals workout class, which is a class in which students come in with their pole goals. Um, sometimes I'll reach out to them beforehand and find out what they are, but sometimes they just spring them on me and it's Sometimes it's a trick that I don't know how to do, but I'll be able to see the mechanics of what they're trying to go for. And, you know, I usually can find some progressions into the tricks. And then, like I said, once I get a certain certain place, I reveal to them that this is as far as I can go. Um, you know, I'll ask another teacher for advice or revert them to another teacher so that they can, you know, go along the path of, achieving those goals because I don't want to hold them back because of my limitations because yeah. I have a lot <laughs> which brings us to our next form of gatekeeping which I'm glad you brought up and I don't know if this is a form of considered gatekeeping um but preventing students um or instructors from going to other classes I don't know if that's gatekeeping or if that is that gatekeeping? I don't really know. <laughs> I, I thought about that too. And I do think it is gatekeeping because here you have like, I did it, <laughs> um, it at our studio when um, there was a studio that opened up right down the street from us. And for a moment, we all got really scared of the ownership of our teaching. And so we made a rule that said, you know, you can't teach the same content in the same month if you're going to be teaching at the studios that are so close together. And um, 
I didn't feel like it was gatekeeping at the time. I just felt like it was something to, to do to protect, you know, our, our business property and stuff like that. But turns out everyone, the tricks are there for everyone. Um, anyone can learn them at any time. So, um, yeah, someone made it known to me that I, that was gatekeeping and I felt really disgusted with that, um, that rule that we had in place. And now it's not there anymore. I don't think we should hold teachers back from teaching whatever they want to whomever they want. Um, I think that is the beauty of, of being a teacher is to offer something that is unique to you. And for me as a boss to prohibit you from doing that just felt really icky um, after it was brought to my attention how it felt from the outside. So I do think that that is gatekeeping for sure. Yes, or even saying, and I've heard some people say, oh, um, don't visit this studio. I've had a bad experience. Um, oh, if you go visit this state, don't visit this studio or take a class with this instructor. I don't know if that's gatekeeping or just slander, but we shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I feel that too. Like that's totally people's opinions and you are, you know, you could listen to that person's opinion or you can go experience it for yourself, which is probably the better thing to do. Yes. Um, or I've heard some people say, oh, no, keep coming here because we'll teach you it. They won't teach you it over there. You don't know that. That's bullshit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um I don't even know. <laughs> I guess also like non-compete. Like if you make your teacher sign a non-compete, I feel like that's also gatekeeping unless you're able to um, saying that they can't teach at other, you know, other studios within a certain uh, location or whatever. I think that if you, unless you're able to pay that teacher full time and give them benefits, that's really shitty because now you're blocking this person from doing what they love and making money doing what they love. Now you've turned it into a part-time gig for them. You should have um, anyone's money flow shit. <laughs> right? Just think about those things. And like, while you might be like holding on to your intellectual property, which is a lot of the reasons why people make non-competes, it also prevents, you know, the free flow of ideas. <laughs> and sharing and caring. <laughs> you all have to learn for sure and make mistakes. Yeah. And some people who, if you're watching or if you know of someone who is doing any of these, they might not even realize it. That is also a very big thing. It's all about perception. They don't realize it. And we can't mm -hmm. emphasize perception enough. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I think it all has to do with with your ego, honestly. Um, and it's the ego of, you know, the person who is putting up the gate <laughs> and also the ego of the person who experiences the gate too. So um, both sides need to just take a look and be like, oh, why is this unsolicited advice being given? <laughs> Is it for safety or is it because someone's blocking me from doing something that I love for whatever reasons they have? Or, yeah, am I not listening? <laughs> so I guess that is uh, gatekeeping from classes and other studios. What other gatekeeping? Um, sexual identity gatekeeping. Um. And I, this isn't as, I don't feel this is as prevalent now, but I feel like back in the day, um, especially when they were trying to like main, make pole dancing mainstream, like maybe 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, et cetera. Um, for men, it was, um, it was for femme men, especially. I feel like a lot of the pole dancers that came out started like you had to be masculine you couldn't express your femininity it was really rare to find those femme male pole dancers and then I think even like some Mr. Poles back in the day like if you were a feminine male dancer you couldn't participate 
uh, you have to be more masculine um, and things like that, which I, but that was way back when, I don't know if any of these places are still doing that. I don't even know if any of these places are still around, but I knew, I do know back then. Um, and even stories we've heard, some studios still do that. Um, if you're coming in as a man, they want you more masculine, or if um, you're more on the feminine side, but you're still a man, they don't want you because they're only completely women, various different, you've heard the stories, different stories of things like that. Um, do I agree with this? Obviously, no. But I do understand the need for certain places um, for, like, example, an all-female pole studio. Maybe that is in place because all those females have sexual trauma with men. Um, and that is their niche or their focus or their audience. Uh, things like that, I understand. But to stop men from coming oh because this is a woman's sport oh or you're too feminine or oh you're too masculine I don't agree with that <laughs> yeah right like if you keep turning people down like just take note of that and maybe be like wow I created this safe space for these other people maybe I should create another safe space for for more people and just think about that because it's yeah Imagine being in one location and, and knowing that there's this one full studio that I can go to that's close by and I'm not welcome here. Yes. Um, the same goes with um, female transitioning to men or females who identify more on the masculine side. Um, I have heard discrimination things against that, like, oh, you're not sexy enough. Oh, you have to wear heels um, for this choreo, um, this, that, and the other. Um, it's hard. Because, um, yeah, in a sexy flow class, you have your idea of what sexy is, but that's not sexy to everyone. There is masculine sexy energy, too, that should be taught and included um it is it's such a fire we could probably make a whole separate episode on this topic itself oh my gosh you just reminded me like it's I'm so glad you brought that up too because it's like when I was creating the playlist for my sexy class and then I realized real quick that like what I consider sexy is not <laughs> what many other people consider sexy and like maybe that you know we should be just more open to all of the different you know different types of sexy and include them more so that people don't feel like they have to be a certain way to be sexy in your class and like even the stories we've heard I think did it god so many stories um, yeah a studio didn't take accept a guy because he was way too feminine um another didn't accept a female because she had short hair and she was more of a tomboy um it's just all bullshit like pole dance that's like saying oh no you can't do yoga because you're like this like I've never heard that why would we do it in pole <laughs> yeah right but sometimes uh, like you said no sometimes people just don't even know that they're being perceived that way or they are or they do know and they're putting their judgment and discrimination stereotypes in something that's true too Shame on you, you're losing massive amounts of money and beauty. <laughs> right? Seriously. That's what I think about all the time. Just like imagine all of the the dancers that you're just, you know, you're you're hushing their voices when they could be, you know, you could be witnessing the beauty that they have. It just makes me really sad. Yes. Um, yeah. We even know it is very sad, but that's why we talk about it and discuss it and hope that things change. Yes. Um, I know. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to go on to my personal experience of like growing up again in the dance world. And, you know, not only did I not have the dancer body, but I started getting tattoos like early on because I was an artist and I wanted to wear my art. And then come to find out that you know the dance world 
didn't appreciate me having artwork on my body and I had to cover my tattoos a lot in order to be accepted and, and to get into auditions. Um, it sucked. It was hot wearing a long sleeved skin colored unitard all over my body. Um, but that was a lot of, you know, I'm, I didn't get a lot of dance jobs. I'm sure of it because of the fact that, Oh, and I was told I was distracting on stage. The audience was just looking at me. <laughs> like, really? That's what we, that's the excuse. Isn't that um, what the audience to be? <laughs> I mean, seriously, it was just so, it blew my mind, all of these, like, doors that had been shut in my face just because of the way that I, you know, present myself, and I, it didn't make me stop. I wrote an article about it, too. I was just like, I'm never covering my tattoos ever again for anyone else because, you know, this is who I am, and, you know, now things are much different tattoos are everywhere no one cares anymore but like it's just like why are you blocking someone just think about it why are you blocking this person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. trying to keep people out of already a stigmatized <laughs> yeah yeah oh another reason um i forgot to bring this up a reason why you would get, keep someone um to help the industry so let's say you're, you are a new performer and you're like, I'm going to start, you know, performing and I'm going to charge $50 to perform. Then <laughs> it's a good idea to reach out to that brand new performer and not to like, be like, you should be charging more like right away. You should give them resources to understand why they should be charging more and then help them out with, you know, contracts, you know, help them help new performers because if you don't they're still going to do it they're still going to do it and they're going to do it without your help and they're going to you know unfortunately take all of the jobs away because they're not charging what they should be charging so i think that that is a uh it's not gatekeeping for safety but it's gatekeeping for um i guess to to uh help artists make a living wage and to not undercut um other artists in your area? I mean, I understand and respect that. But in the end, this is a business. <laughs> 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 and, um, I definitely understand that um, in the aspect of getting paid for what you're worth. Um, if you're charging too low, why? I know we all have imposter syndrome, but get paid what you're worth. As for being fair to others, lordy, 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 how do I say this without pissing someone off? We're in a business, and if um, it's like if you go to a store, if I can get this product, it does the exact same thing, but even more so, but the name isn't the name brand but it's much cheaper. What should I go for? The name brand because everybody knows it and this is well known or the product that I'm actually getting more from, but it is cheaper because it's not well known. You know what I mean? Um, I feel that for sure. But if you're going to provide the service for less and even more for less, then why would anyone, then all of the other artists you know it's hard for everyone to make a living wage that's the only thing but that um i i don't i don't know if i agree with that because we all have our fan base and our audiences um, i definitely understand where you're coming from um and i could see how it I, I feel like so if if so like let's say you strolled in and you were and I was charging a hundred dollars for something that you decided you wanted to charge fifty dollars for and you put me and others out of business because and you took everyone else's business and now your business is booming is that fair or could we have all worked together shared the resources and we would all be making more money <laughs> 
because we controlled the market. I, <laughs> I understand what you mean because of the networking aspect and all working together. Um, but in the end, it is business. I think we are all allowed to make our own prices, whatever they are. If we are willing to do that extra work for that small amount of price, kudos to you. Um, fair, I mean, I don't know. I understand wanting to be working together and making more money. That's when the affiliation, affiliate links come in. Oh, sign up for this purse, buy this product, and we're supporting them. I definitely understand that. But I also think if you're willing to do all that work and make this price, go for it. Like, we cannot tell you. Uh, well, I think the thing is that what um, my is reasoning that, behind it is perhaps this new performer who is... Um, or maybe it's an older performer. Maybe they don't have, you know, the the insurances that you need. Maybe they don't have other things that are necessary for safety. Because um, if I were to charge, you know, like fifty dollars to perform, it wouldn't cover it wouldn't um, cover my insurance to to perform. You know, the all the classes that I paid for to get better at my art. Um, and all that other stuff. And that person's, you answered your own problem. That person's going to lose the money. <laughs> they're <trying. laughs> So they're obviously not going to make money. It, I, I feel it all balances out. Because um, there is a certain point of when you charge less. And like you said, you won't be able to afford the insurance, the classes um, for that. It all catches up. Um, I don't know. Because, I mean, look, you go to New York and you're paying like 60, 75 bucks for a pole class. You come here, you're paying 25, 30. And I know it's based on location and stuff. But That's why I feel like the communities should help each other. But I'll give you an, an example of what happened to me with this. Yeah, the circus troupe that I started, that this other group of circus performers I mean, a lot of circus performers contacted me and many of them were awesome and offered me advice and, you know, like gave me, you know, contract information so that I could look at and, and use from, for my stuff. But then there was another one who didn't even care that we had performance experience, just saw that we were new and basically told me that I had to call the performance troupe pre-professional um, and we had to charge a certain amount because we were pretty professional. We couldn't um, call ourselves professional. And I asked when it would be appropriate for us to be called professional. And there was no guidance given or anything. This in, to me was like 100% gatekeeping. I felt, you know, even though like I, they had me questioning my years of experience, you know, all the trainings that I had, all the safety things that I underwent um, and now I had to call myself pre-professional um, I agree that's gate that's like in the competitions um, I the only thing I don't agree with is the pricing thing <laughs> <laughs> if you can charge less and still make a profit with everything else you have going on kudos to you yes we should all be working together helping each other make more money but there's different ways to do that affiliation links um marketing or sharing things i don't know <laughs> right you're right though now that i'm thinking about it the setting of the prices could be considered gatekeeping um could be considered gatekeeping if you don't i think it's gatekeeping if you don't want x client like i don't want poor people so i'm gonna make my classes 75 bucks so i get that high clientele that's the thing yeah I think that's definitely gatekeeping. Yeah. You try to look, keep your price low and make that money. If everybody else's business goes out, they did something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see that, Chris. But maybe the thing that they did wrong was they charged, you know, more than you. <laughs> like there's a point when you make money that you're either charging too less and you're not going to make that money. Like you said, you have insurance, certifications, all this. 
And then there's a sweet spot where people are like, oh, this is doable, but you can still make the profit and you're still cheaper than those name brand things. You know what I'm saying? I feel that for sure. You're right. There does become a time when you perhaps would become so bloated in your price gouging that you wouldn't understand what you have done to the industry. Yeah, I feel that. Right, because right now, everyone's broke. (laughs) So maybe we should all adjust our prices. (laughs) Whole class money on gas. Right, seriously. Like things, if (laughs) things keep continuously going up, how will we ever keep up with that? You're right. It's like that interview we just had, which is going to air like next month. Um, (laughs) Really is a privilege. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. But then it goes back to we should all communicate with each other. And, you know, if we all work together, we can kind of decide better rather than, you know, leaving leaving people to their own devices. And then working with each other by hands down we should all be working together right right those people that reached out to me and helped me uh you know as a as a new performance troupe I was so thankful and you know to those that tried to gatekeep me still here actually my circus troupe is not still here but still here. <laughs> like you're not gonna that's the thing you're not gonna stop people from doing what they love so you can either you know get out of the way or help them you're just gonna make yeah 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 make people hate you (laughs) right why would you not want to make connections why would you want to just like unless there's other circumstances i guess (laughs) for sure yeah that was good we had a little disagreement we hashed it out see (laughs) (laughs) y'all right over that it's so good um, that we bring that up because that is, you know, part of the gatekeeping that has been ingrained in me. Like, like let's set these prices, but no, let's think about it. Yeah. And it's, they can't always keep growing. Yeah, it's hard because you have the business aspect. And of course, you have the networking aspect. <laughs> mm-hmm. We should be working together, but we all got to make money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and then between different studios, like you don't know how much overhead one studio has, um, you know, against another one. So if if one studio is able to pay their teachers one amount and the other studio another amount, like you can't really, you know, every, every studio is different. <laughs> you can't compare them one thing that one thing I will agree with you on kind of with the price thing and I uh I guess I can't I don't even know if I should say it um the complete difference in pay scale of when you're a pole star doing a workshop in a studio and when you're um not a pole star and you do a workshop in a studio (laughs) Wow, um, I'm so glad you bring this up, Chris. <laughs> I think that's probably one of the only things where I understand what you mean with the price thing, because that, um, I mean, it hurts. <laughs> well, here's the thing, like, it, it does hurt us because here we have, you know, workshop teachers that are, are well worth the money, for sure, but maybe in their community, and then they come to our community and where a lot of us can't afford those prices, you know? And it's not like it's, you know, a, a thousand times more incredible teaching. Like it's still, you know, the same amazing teaching that we all offer. <laughs> Some studios will pay maybe like a couple hundred dollars for someone to come, even pay for their traveling and stuff. Yeah. But when it's like someone like you and I, let, let me not say someone like you and I, because we stars in our own right. <laughs> <laughs> you get no travel and pay like what, 30, 40, 50 bucks? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the thing. I'll do it when I'm on vacation out there. 
that's um, the thing like this is for fun and frolic but no we're trying to make a living um i that's when i really get frustrated with prices um just because i've seen like the difference in it just because of where you are what your name is um yeah and that's really frustrating <laughs> <laughs> right right that's the thing though like the quality of teaching yes. is likely the same for all of our amazing all of the amazing teachers it doesn't matter you know how long you've been doing it or you know sometimes the prices are just really high I guess I guess I can't <laughs> because like when you go in the fitness world you have like a Jillian Michaels workout and then you have some bitch you've never heard of <laughs> and the prices are different um, mm -hmm. or if you have like a star come like if you I don't know what science do like there's a difference of having Katy Perry come and some trap artist that you don't even know who the fuck they are with like much less followers. Mm -hmm. I guess I understand that with price gauging. Um, but I feel like sometimes people won't even negotiate with you if your name, That's the thing. Your name isn't like big. Like they just like, well, this is it. I'm like, well, why am I going to do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's been you know, several workshop leaders who I had to turn down just because I know for a fact, nobody in our community will be able to afford this workshop. And, and then it'll, if it puts me in a hole, you know, like, cause now I have to pay for the room and board of these amazing artists, which but I'm not saying they're not worth it. <laughs> it's just like certain, you know, certain places can, can afford, I guess, I guess that is gatekeeping. Or even when people ask us, I feel like, okay, yeah, I would love to do a workshop, but why am I going to do all that traveling and get paid less than what I would make at my normal studio when if I was someone else, I'm not going to list names, um, mm -hmm. but I had like more followers or whatever, you'd be able to negotiate a couple hundred dollars more. It's like, it's things like that that really kind of frustrate me. Like I yeah. just, name as them but I have all my certifications I have the experience um it's just interesting it, it is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we ended up in payment gatekeeping somehow <laughs> right there's so many like <laughs> there's so many ways that that gatekeeping is in the whole industry yeah that's like when I, um, I always have to catch myself and be like, oh, this store-bought thing is much better than this homemade thing. But like, that's not true. Just because the store-bought thing was manufactured by like, a, you know, like through this thing that everyone has, um, you know, put together and then it was a approved by this board and now it's okay to be sold. But then somebody else making it, it's less, valuable because it's not from a store like I have to stop myself all the time because that is 100% not true and you know we're missing <laughs> we're missing the voices <laughs> I don't know what other forms of gatekeeping goodness this <laughs> I, know, I, thought, I promised myself I would not go off on a tangent but I I feel like I went off five times I think because we had that disagreement where everybody got to lose <laughs> <But, laughs> right, I feel like we should we should definitely make another episode about that and, and um maybe about how to how to price your work and and why it differs per region and why you need to take that into consideration maybe something like negotiating your class and performance fees or something I don't know <laughs> yeah yeah um right? but that's for another conversation i think the one last gatekeeping thing we wanted to talk about was in competition oh yeah yeah um this one's really hard we talked about gatekeeping and competitions of sexuality and gender i don't think there's as many i think there's maybe one or two and i don't even know if they're in the united states where like it's only women and no men but I don't I think that's just because yeah this is for women 
Mm -hmm. I don't think it's based on like, oh, he's too feminine. I'm not sure. I hope not. I hope not. Um, but other competition things, um, level things. Um, I think one thing that really pissed me off this year with PSO was one of the comments. Um, I did professional and my goal was to tell a story and have fun. It was not to work on the hardest tricks. It was not to win. It was to tell a story and have fun. And that's exactly what the fuck I did. Yeah. Um, well, one of the comments really irked me when it said, um, if you wanted to do this level, you should have added harder tricks. Next time you should do a different level. Um, and that really fucking pissed me off <laughs> because just because I didn't have harder tricks does not mean I can't do professional level. That wasn't my goal in my piece. My piece was to tell a story and have fun. Um, and other people, a lot of other people I've talked to have gotten comments like that. Like you should have had mm -hmm. harder transitions or easier train i've even heard some people be told you should have had easier tricks or easier transitions um like this wasn't your level um i guess it, that's considered sandbagging but some people do that unintentionally um but yeah to tell someone you should have harder tricks and harder transitions i think is fucked up um, maybe I'm the only person who thinks that, but you don't know what their goal was with their piece. Um, I did pro level because I've been doing this for years. I wanted four minutes to tell my story. Um, and I wanted the flexibility to have fun with it. Um, I didn't want to win. I wanted to have fun. Um, and it was a slap in the face. Oh, you should have had harder tricks. Bitch, follow me on Instagram. You'll see all my hard tricks and I kill it. Um, I think that is a form of gatekeeping. Little stupid things like that. Or another one which you and I get, why do you have heels in this artistic piece? Bitch, because it's part of my artistic piece. <laughs> um, I got that comment once and I think you did too. Yeah. Um, I got the harder tricks one too. They always want to see harder tricks. But the thing they don't understand is like, some of us are old. <laughs> and like, also, if I were to drop down a level, I would get yelled at yes. at this point. Like people would call it, say I was sandbagging. So like, is there a place for me? Or are you gatekeeping the professional category at PSO? <laughs> You're too funny. <laughs> I don't think the higher up are gatekeeping. Maybe it's just the judges. <laughs> <laughs> right. Those so is just something that judges should, you know, if you come in with, a, you know, an open mind again and be curious about what you're watching, especially the artistic category, like don't be telling us that we need to be doing harder tricks. Or point your toes and straight knees. If I wanted that, I would have fucking done championship. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't want any of that. That's why I wanted to tell my story. That's or okay. one is creative gatekeeping. And again, I'm going back to a comment. One of the comments that it didn't piss me off, it hurt because you know how hard I worked on my piece um, to tell my story. Um, yeah. I don't know who it was. If you're listening, maybe you didn't intend to, but you should not have wrote this comment. Um, did you really think about your piece before presenting to it? I did not understand it or like it. You should have really thought about it beforehand. <laughs> that really hurt um, and really upset me because I was so proud of that piece. I didn't win, but I had so much fun and I enjoyed the fuck out of it. So when that comment came like a month later, I was like, wow. <laughs> it really, I can't even believe like, someone who's a volunteer judge would say something like that. If you didn't like the piece, that's okay. But to come at me and say, did you really think about the concept? Yeah, I thought about the fucking concept. If I did it, I would have done freestyle. <laughs> right, that's the thing. It's just like, do you think about, like, do you really need to include that comment? First of all, like, is that a constructive comment to give someone? Or did you just completely make me think that you you know, gatekeeped my whole opportunity to, you know, shine in this, you know, on this stage here, because now I feel like 
people are just being judgmental and, you know, not being open-minded. Maybe it's not. Like we said, it's our perception, but it feels like a creative kind of gatekeeping in the competition scene. And we're not blaming you, PSO, because we... Yeah, no, we love PSO. <laughs> work hard, and we thank you for the opportunities you have given us. But some of the volunteer judges, I feel, they put their opinions or their pole dance studio beliefs and flick their on pole dancers that they've never met before. And, yeah. and it's... Or even pole dancers that they have met before and they just don't want to see succeed, which is really upsetting. There's um, a thing saying, oh, your knee and your brass monkey could have looked tighter. I saw it slip. Okay, yeah, give me that comment. But to come and say, did you really think about this before presenting to us? It doesn't look like it. No, that's bullshit. <laughs> yeah, no, especially like the amount of work that you put into that piece, number one. Like, how could someone even say that you had no thought into that? Because you had... How many costume changes? <laughs> Two, three. Yeah, just in that aspect, like that one comment is absolutely ridiculous. And I, then just because the, it's fucking fun. <laughs> yeah, and just because they didn't feel moved by your performance doesn't mean that they should, you know, judge you any less. Yeah. Or at least include those comments because those aren't helpful in any way i'm not i can't get mad because this pso god the standing ovation i got from the fans that was far worth it like y'all beautiful people that clap for me if you remember my piece love y'all um <laughs> that was beautiful it truly was memorable but a month later when those comments came in i was like i'm never fucking doing this shit again <laughs> yeah right it just makes you think because these are our peers you know and these are volunteer peers so they're taking time out of their long day. And they're to, anonymous. You don't even know who they are. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't know what, you know, either preconceived notions they have about us or any, if they don't know you at all, they don't give you any time of day just because they haven't heard of you before. Your friend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just things to think about if you're, you know, if you put yourself at the top, think about what you're doing. Like, I yeah. don't know. Again, this is not a low blow at PSO. Y'all are amazing and we are so thankful for the opportunities you give us. It is a jab at some of the volunteer judges who, <laughs> yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I, you know, PSO has, has listened to you know everyone so much that I just appreciate them I hope you know they take a listen to this and just you know think about maybe maybe having a little different criteria for maybe the professional judges at least or maybe the whole judging system <laughs> I know they already revamped it like five times it's hard I can't imagine what that must be like yeah. to figure out how to judge people <laughs> I think when you have volunteer judges at all levels, um, it makes it very hard. Yeah. Well, I was even thinking like, it's really easy for me to find meaning in other people's movement because I enjoy finding that meaning. And I, I don't know, I, I have a weird empathy, I guess. <laughs> but some people might not, you know, have the same interpretation based on just how they are. Yeah. Um, oh, and I think another thing that pissed me off with gatekeeping, when they paired me with, when they put me in the group with all the women. That was another thing. That was really odd to me as well. Um, I was so excited to do that play level men division. And I didn't understand it because the men championship, there was two of them and they got to perform, but they put me because I was the only male artistic with women artistic. And I don't think, I don't think that was fair because women, y'all are fucking incredible. You get the flexibility, the strength, y'all kill it. I think as a male, I should have been put in a different category. And I know, I think I understand why they did it because if I was the only one who performed, I would have won, even if they didn't like my piece and that would have sent me to nationals. So I'm thinking that's probably why they mixed this up. But even then, why didn't they mix the two men up with the women championship? 
That's what I, yeah, I ended up reaching out to them about that because it, it didn't sit with me the right way either. And it was explained to me that the artistic category was like all encompassing of a lot of different things. And that championship was more of like, you know, the tricks based and technique. So it was more um, strategic, I guess. But still, if you're trying to compete against your peers, like number one, we're all different ages. Yes. Like it could be like any age from 20 to like 80 <laughs> or even above. That's number one, which is not really fair. But number two, I do kind of think that, you know, uh, either put them all together, put us all together then. Don't just separate some. <laughs> and it's interesting that they say artistic is supposed to be a certain thing, a mix of stuff. But when you always get the judging comments, it's always techniques or stuff yeah. that doesn't have to do with the artistry side or it's a low blow to your art. <laughs> That's the thing. That's the thing. And there was several other dancers backstage who we were all like worried that the judges would not be able to understand what we were putting on stage or if it was too much of high art, which you know, that happened. <laughs> Sometimes it's, you know, it's maybe it's not meant for the competition stage, but where else are we going to put this stuff? This is something I made and I'm proud of it. I am not mad about who I lost to. They were all fucking incredible. They all <laughs> win. The only thing I'm mad about is those comments I received. I think they were a little bit opinionated and personal. And I think people added their own form of gatekeeping at the competition level. Yeah, I agree. And I think that is awesome that you brought that up. Yeah. But again, it's all about perception. Maybe that person who wrote that comment wasn't trying to hurt my feelings, but. <laughs> right, like I kind of think like, how would they think that that was helpful? But like, honestly, do they really think that you came into the competition and just like threw your, your routine together? And like, who would do that? Who would even do that? <laughs> freestyling that's the point of freestyle hey <laughs> like the, yeah i just i don't know goodness gatekeeping anyway gatekeeping <laughs> we are sorry we're just sharing our experiences our stories what we have learned um as always this is all about perception um you may be gatekeeping and not even know it um it could be all good intentions or it could just be how the outside people see what you're doing and they don't understand why you're doing it mm -hmm. uh, it could be just I felt it could just be as simple as I felt a certain way about that comment maybe they weren't gatekeeping or anything it really is perception yeah. so we apologize this is a conversation because it needs to be talked about um, yeah we told you season two would be full of drama <laughs> i'm like this obviously makes us feel you know emotional because it's now what march and the competition was in november and this is you know this is our art and i know i'm not doing this year it really i think i'm gonna stay close with this for a while <laughs> <laughs> right uh, yeah so how they set it up it was the volunteer judges i was like i'm not doing it anymore yeah, I think it for me as well, just because I, um, you know, I'm an aging pole dancer and just the pressure of doing the harder tricks in that level that I'm not allowed to move out of now, it just is frustrating. So I just want to stick to showcases and things that make me feel good. Because <laughs> I know I'm good. <laughs> you are good. We're all amazing. Everybody. I mean, pole dancing is so hard. I don't like what, two, 3% of the population does it? Like we are all super amazing. Yeah, oh, I guess I should talk about too, um, the gatekeeping of like the pro card when you're in competition. Like you can't get your, you you can't be called a professional until you're a certain level. Um, <laughs> in first place, right? <laughs> right, that's the thing. Like it's just, I'm like, glad you who, who gets to bestow upon you the title? Oh, yeah. professional. I, I never understood that. I always wanted a pro card. But when I learned that you have to join a competition and then win first place in the pro level, 
I was like, well, that's bullshit. Cause what if like I perform every year for 10 years and never win first place, I can't get my pro card just because no. other people are winning. That is no, a- you're not a pro. I think that's a big form of gatekeeper. I'm glad you brought up that I completely forgot about. Yeah. Like what the fuck? Like, yeah, I'm not Coco P Hong, but I got certified in one, two, three, and four. I got all the experience. Um, it's just interesting. Yeah. What what other hoops do we have to jump through to be recognized? But just something to think about. That's why I slapped the pro on my Instagram. <laughs> Too funny. <laughs> and I think even for stars, like Donna Carno just won the nationals. Congratulations, by the way. And even before she won nationals, she was fucking killing it. And we all know it, but she couldn't get that pro card until she won nationals. I don't think that's fair. Yeah. It's clear she's a fucking professional. <laughs> right. And- There's so many dancers like that. Yes. Yeah. Dancers, you're 100 percent right. That's just the name that came to my mind real quick. Yeah. Um, and just because they don't compete or go through the competition, you know, they can't earn that title or feel confident in calling themselves a pro. Ah, <laughs> oh, which is another episode. We should definitely do an episode about imposter syndrome. I feel like we did last season about self-confidence. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Good episode to touch on again, because, I mean, imposter syndrome and confidence and self-esteem is constant battle in pole dancing. Right. There's so many, um, like I saw recently, a studio owner had posted. They were like, you know, I've been a studio owner for five years and do all of these things. And yet I still get nervous that people don't like me. (laughs) Like, it's like that. But why do we feel like that? Because people are gatekeeping it. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. Have any other on gatekeeping? Feel free to reach out. Maybe we can make a second episode. Again, this is all our opinions and everything we've learned, experienced, and have heard. Mm-hmm. Um, it's always about perception. Um, yeah. Some of the things right. we might not have had any m- bad intent, but this is how it was perceived. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I remember when I first got certified to teach um, flex, I wanted to teach at this fitness place that hired me, but it ended up being like in the same building as this circus studio where I used to take class. And they literally reached out to me and, and told me that I should not teach in the same building as them because I was a threat to their classes and I was going to be teaching the same content. But it was so weird to me because here's this established circus studio reaching out to this one individual person who just got certified to teach. Like, how am I supposed to get started here if you're just going to block me? And it was just so annoying. And I ended up standing up to them because I had had enough at that point. Like, you can't stop people from doing what they love. They're just going to do it. So just get out of their way. Unless it's not safe. (laughs) You're too funny. Oh, this episode's gone over an hour. Yeah, I know. I was thinking about that too. Um, I did want to say though, like, because it is sometimes hard to understand when gatekeeping is happening. So if like if it you feel like somebody, like you'll feel it. I don't know. I kind of feel it in my gut, like when something is like, and then I'm like, okay, and then making little compromises with myself inside. But in the end, you know. Be true to yourself and if you are trying to to express yourself and and you feel resistance first ask yourself why you're getting that resistance because it might be the safety thing um but if it's not and and it's just you know maybe it's the other person's ego you know try to bring it to their attention that maybe they should take a look at why they're trying to stop you from doing the thing yeah or even ask them like why (laughs) <laughs> and you'll be able to tell if they're lying like she said you get a feeling but definitely talk to them about it yeah I feel like oftentimes with gatekeeping we assume not I mean I don't really have much experience it but in life in general we make assumptions 
and we think something's going on because it's perceived that way and we don't talk about it and it's completely different so I'm glad yeah. that you to the instructor about it right because it usually like uh, for me it comes out across as like unsolicited advice why is this person giving me this helpful advice <laughs> and sometimes it is helpful advice but sometimes it's you know this gatekeeping so I wanted to first recommend that everyone should just mind their own business <laughs> you know just mind your own business and if someone's doing something you know across from you and it's not hurting you in any way you know just leave them alone or offer your support with love because that's the best thing that you could do you know and maybe be a mentor if you know more than this person don't block them offer assistance so they can grow as you have and I don't know I said this at the beginning but people are always going to remember how you made them feel so if you you know come out and you're like hey I was here first doing this thing what's going on here like just think about how that will come across <laughs> but if you came at them with like hey I'm also in this industry I noticed that you're here too Do you want to like you know have a little chat um, and talk about what how your you know your businesses and my businesses maybe we could be have a mutually beneficial relationship um, and that takes work but you know, I think it's better than just you know giving your unsolicited advice to keep someone from doing something that you're doing um some instructors might not even realize it <laughs> yeah yeah giving advice and some students look at me funny i'm like i'm i don't mean anything by it i'm not just trying to help so i mean <laughs> but yeah if you're if you come from a place of love i don't think you can ever go wrong um you know don't try to hurt people <laughs> yeah we want we're here to help people grow or at least that's why how i feel grow ourselves yeah and maybe like there was somebody else who um, we put this on our Instagram and asked listeners to share their experiences with gatekeeping. And one person reached out and said, just be mindful of like the camaraderie that you have in the studio. Cause a lot of times it'll be like, you know, you'll feel really strong in your, in your friend group, but are you keeping other people from coming into that friend group? Have you become a click? Um, and that is a little bit of an issue. Yeah, it is. Oh, the last big one, gatekeeping between strippers and dancer, pole dancers and pole dancers and strippers. Um, if you're a pole dance studio or a pole coach or a pole instructor, you should not be stopping a student just because they have a stripper background. It's unacceptable. Um, just because they want to be sexier or whatever, it's unacceptable. Pole dance is expression. Um, you should not gatekeep them from learning amazing tricks just because of that stripper background or they want to focus on that sexy area. And the same goes for vice versa. If you're in the strip club and you're stripping, you should not be um, turning away or disrespecting the strippers who actually take pole classes because they want to get better because they're trying to make their money and they're doing their work. So who are you to say, oh, that person shouldn't be stripping because they're doing this in the pole class, that they shouldn't be wearing heels, this, that, and the other? Fuck you. Mm -hmm. You do business. Um, you should be inspired that that person is taking those classes to make their money and make more money and be good at what they do. That shows determination, motivation, and that they really care about their stripping job. Um, it's just interesting. <laughs> right? Though so it's like not everything is for everyone. And that goes back to just mind your own business. <laughs> right? Let people do what they love. And if they're not hurting anyone or, you know. It frustrates me. I understand why people in the pole fitness, pole sport um, side try to stem away from the stripping. I understand that because it's so stigmatized, especially here in the U.S. They hear pole dance and they're like, oh okay that's usually what happens it's getting better but i mean 
dance is expression, dance is creativity. If they wanna, if they have that stripping background or they wanna stay as a stripper or they wanna be sexy, who are you to tell them no just because you wanna stay away from that stigmatism with pole dancing and stuff? Yeah, the stigma sucks. It's hard. <laughs> um, especially if you're a male pole dancer, the disgusting comments I get on a daily basis, it's really awful. But God, just, uh, it just, it frustrates me um, when strippers want to get better and pole, comp pole studios are saying no because we're trying to stem away from that or vice versa. It really is frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, it's not even like um, strippers trying to get better either. It's just, you know, strippers trying to learn the technique that the pole studios ha can provide. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, not that you can't get technique in the strip club, but Oh, no, if you can, because I got injured so many times. In this <laughs> oh my gosh, my AirPod has now timed out. I can, I can hear it. It sounds different. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay, because we're ending this episode. <laughs> Wait, I promised myself I would not go on and on, but it is, uh, you know, it's a subject that is close to my heart just because of growing up in the dance world. And it's just really sad um, to see that. Um, we can't all share and have a good time. It's like, this is mine and you can't have it. And only my friends can have it or whatever. It's really annoying. Yes. It's really annoying. Let me in. It is. Um, uh, yeah, feel free to leave your comments as always. And we can make another episode if we need to. If we upset any of you, we apologize. This is just our opinions. This is entertainment. Um, this is us discussing things. PSO, once again, we were not talking about you. We love you. All you do, it is the volunteer judges that pissed us off, not you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, always remember everything's about perception. If you think someone's gatekeeping, have a conversation. Maybe they're not. Or if you are gatekeeping and you don't even realize and you're wondering what's going on, talk to people, find out what's going on. Um, I feel like that's a lot of, that could be a lot of issue with the gatekeeping, some communication. Yeah, because it's a lot about our egos too. You know, we don't want to be ever told that we're hurting other people or we're, you know, making people feel a certain way. But sometimes we are. Yeah, that's how we learn. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we hope you enjoy this episode, even our little disagreement where we had to hash it out. <laughs> right? I don't even think it was a real disagreement. It was um, just, you know, I, learning about the different sides of it because it's something that I hadn't really considered. I guess that's right. But I'm pretty sure I literally said I don't agree with that. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> but you're right. It was us for, um, explaining our sides of it. <laughs> Um, what else i think that's it for gatekeeping oh exciting news so we are now um affiliates of bees knees knee pads and well they sell more than knee pads <laughs> <laughs> yes you didn't watch season one we had the blessing and pleasure of interviewing sarah bees of bees knees who creates beautiful knee pads that are removable beautiful designs um and you can change the padding easily um and she also makes teacher instructor guides and pole goal guides um and she reached out to us and offered us this affiliation so those links will now be added to almost everything <laughs> you can yeah comments below um we the disclaimer is we do get a small commission but this is at no extra cost to you it is just us networking and sharing an amazing product um thank you sarah from bees knees for that we are truly grateful um but yeah we'll keep you updated with that we will promote that um and share that and let them know if you buy those amazing knee pads that we sent you over and be sure to check out her inspiring story it was last season but it truly is inspiring how she became a pole entrepreneur and found a need in the pole community and fulfilled that need yeah. um, and these are products made specifically for pole dancers and they're all ethically made um it's a woman-owned business um and just 
you know, amazing product that lasts a really long time. My knee pads, you know, are, are going on two years now and they're, they're awesome. Oh no, it'll be one year now. <laughs> yeah. Two years, it'll still be awesome. There's also a brand new pole bag that she's made again, specifically designed for pole dancers to hold all of your heels and all that other stuff. Um, and I think if I read correctly, I may be, I hope I'm not blowing smoke up my ass, but eventually when you use our link, there will be like a discount, a small discount. I am not sure. I believe I read that. We have to reread them. Don't quote me again. I am not a hundred percent sure, but I think eventually when you use our link, there will be a discount. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we are excited about that. And we're open to new affiliate products and ideas if you want to hook up with us and you are uh have a product or an idea that aligns with our goals um we would be happy to advertise <laughs> and of course always feel free to check out our products which ooh, excuse me is also in the link in the comments we have interactive posters and interactive pole deck cards and so much more um yes but they are pretty cool. Like they all have pictures and a QR code, which will link you to tutorials that you can hang in your studio or your home post studio, or you can bring the deck of cards with you everywhere. Um, pretty some cool stuff. Um, and goodness, yes, we are working on apparel, but that's another story for another day. Please make sure you share and save this episode, share it with other people. Um, and let us know what you think in the comments. Um, if you agree, if you don't agree, if you want us to make another episode touching on something else. Um, if you want to be interviewed about your gaslighting experiences, we would love to share it just because it is kind of an interesting subject. Um, as we found during this whole two hours, <laughs> we yeah. kept coming up with more instances. Or if you want to be interviewed, please let us know. Or if you want to be shared on our grand and all the other stuff send us a beautiful poll pic of you um and we'll add a quote to it and share it or you can give us the pic and the quote and we'll put it together and share it and of course don't forget our free april showcase open to everyone around the world and we want to see what you got a dance uh a full dance routine that you worked on, an edited pole music video because you want to look like a star, maybe a pole combo you're proud of or a pole trick you're proud of, maybe a quick tutorial. And I mean quick because some tutorials be like 30 minutes. We can't do that now, y'all. <laughs> also, another thing that I don't think I put on Instagram, but I do want to say, um, if you have something that you want to promote, um, like a whole brand or whole class or something promote it this showcase is to help market pole dancing we want to share all of your talents we want to share all your pole businesses um just so other people who are watching can find it and we can kind of network um but yeah we definitely hope to see submissions from y'all they don't have to be long they could be cute the only requirement is that it's pole dancing and no nudity. If there's a slippage, it happens. But don't come out in your like birthday suit. <laughs> yeah, we have to put it on YouTube, and then our yeah. whole showcase will be censored. <laughs> um, um, oh, and so uh, lollipop lira is okay, and pole silks are okay too. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you want to market something and need a platform to do it on, please send us your video. That is the point of this showcase. We want us all to see each other, network, and yeah, have a good time. Be creative. Yeah. Yeah. April 15th. April. With, a, with a little leeway if you message us. <laughs> <laughs> just the day or the day before the showcase saying oh i'm so sorry so are we <laughs> <laughs> yes and we're hoping to have the show on april 30th right yes a sunday because the 29th we have another one <laughs> <laughs> yes oh stars yeah let me stop <laughs> oh my gosh okay we're not yet but we're working on it <laughs> That all pole dancers are pole stars. I said that earlier. Wait, all you have to do is write it in your description on your Instagram. Pole star. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's it.
Yes, but please be sure to share all this and reach out with anything, comments, concerns, questions. Um, thank you so much for tuning into this conversation on gatekeeping. Yeah, I think I said gaslighting earlier. Oh, gaslighting. Yes, you did. <laughs> it be gatekeeping. My bad. <laughs> I don't think there's any gaslighting in the poll, poll industry. Too funny. And if there is, stop it right now. <laughs> Game straight. If we've been here so long, I'm trying to. Think <laughs> oh my gosh! We're gonna sign out now before yes. we on another tangent. Um, but thank you again so much for tuning into this episode. Make sure to tune in for next week for another beautiful pole dancer interview, which is so inspiring because we're always inspired by them. And reach out to us. Talk to us. We're friendly. We're busy, but we're friendly. We'll respond eventually. Oh, friendly. <laughs> oh my Thank God. You for tuning in. I'm Chris Rivers. And I'm Mandy Mack. And we are. Green <laughs> ass um, shorts. I just don't match today. <laughs> That's all right. I have my girl. Ew, these socks are gross. <laughs>